In this video, we'll continue where we left off with the sinus rhythms, and we'll explore the three remaining sinus rhythms, sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, and sinus dysrhythmia, or sinus arrhythmia, and we'll compare and contrast how these three additional rhythms actually only vary from normal sinus rhythm by maybe one or two characteristics each. So let's recall that each and every single time we name something a sinus rhythm, that's because we've identified that it's coming from the SA node right here, the main primary pacemaker of the heart. And the SA node is located in the top right rear corner of the right atrium. And it produces a very characteristic marking on the EKG, which is an upright P wave followed by a QRS complex. So anytime we see that marking of a nice upright rounded P wave that precedes a QRS complex, we're going to call it a sinus rhythm because we know it must come from the sinoatrial node or the SA node. All right, so these are the common characteristics that we described before. We're going to say that there must be one P wave for every QRS co complex. It must be upright, and generally it's rounded in shape, and that, T that P wave must precede the QRS complex in order for us to call the underlying rhythm a sinus rhythm. So let's take a look at all of the different sinus rhythms that we have at our disposal to choose from here when we're looking at the EKG. And you'll notice that in the left-hand column here, we're looking at the five-step method of evaluating the EKG. In this case, we're going to look for a P wave. Is it upright? What's its shape? Is it nice and rounded and smooth? Is the PR interval within a normal duration range? And we've listed those here. Next, what's the QRS duration? Now, generally speaking, the QRS duration will fall within these thresholds of 40 to 120 milliseconds. Your books may say 80 to 120. It may also say 60 to 120. It's just important for us to recognize that the QRS complex should not exceed 120 milliseconds in duration in order for us to call it sinus rhythm, although it is possible to have QRS complexes that are longer than that when we have bundle branch block or aberrantly conducted situations, and we'll talk about those in another video. All right, so I've highlighted the changes for you. You'll see that the changes between sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, and sinus dysrhythmia, or sinus arrhythmia. The only difference between these four rhythms, in essence, lies within the rate, and I've highlighted that for you. And in the case of sinus dysrhythmia, it's the regularity of the rhythm that differentiates sinus dysrhythmia from normal sinus rhythm or one of the other sinus rhythms. So let's explore those a little bit better. So we've already said that in general, when we have a P wave and it's upright and it precedes the QRS complex, we're going to call that a sinus rhythm. And now we need to differentiate the different types of sinus rhythms. There are a total of four that we're going to examine, normal sinus rhythm, and then sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, and sinus arrhythmia, or sinus dysrhythmia. I'll use those two terms interchangeably. In essence, these three in highlighted in red, those are the ones we're going to explore in this video. All right, so let's take a look at sinus bradycardia. So remember from the previous chart that the only difference between normal sinus rhythm and sinus bradycardia is the rate. Everything else is going to be exactly the same. So let's see if that holds true. All right, are there P waves? And is there only one P wave that precedes each QRS complex? And is it upright? And is it nice and smooth and rounded? So let's take a look here. All right, so here's a P wave. This is this little deflection here that tells us about depolarization from the SA node. And in fact, there is a QRS complex that follows it. Here's another P followed by another QRS. Here's one more P followed by one QRS. And last but not least, another P followed by the QRS complex. So in this case, we do have one P wave for every QRS. They are upright, they are rounded. Next, we're going to look for the PR interval duration. So let's uh, take any of these here, and we're going to say that the PR interval starts at the beginning of the P wave, and it ends at the end of the PR segment, or just where it enters the QRS complex. So let's count the number of boxes here. We have one, two, three, and just about four small boxes. So that's 160 milliseconds. Four small boxes, 40 milliseconds each small box. That's 160 milliseconds. That's a normal PR interval. Next, let's look at the QRS duration. So in this case, it's going to be one, two, two and a half small boxes. So that puts us at 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds is within the normal range, less than 120 milliseconds, so that's good. Next, we're going to look for the regularity of the rhythms. Are the QRS complexes separated by the same distance? 
Again, there are multiple ways to do that. I would caution you, the faster the rhythm gets, the more difficult it is to appreciate subtle variations in regularity. So it's always important for you to take a little piece of scratch paper or a note card and actually put little hash marks on that note card that correspond to the duration or the distance of these QRS complexes and then just march those out and see in fact whether or not the QRS complexes fall on those hash marks. If they do, the rhythm is regular. If they don't, the rhythm is irregular. In this case, the rhythm is very regular. So last but not least, we're going to look at the rate here and we're going to define the rate. We can use the sequence method or we can use any other method that we choose in this case, I'll use the sequence method. You don't have to use this method since it's going to go beyond 60. And we'll say 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 47, 43. So we're right around the 45 mark. So we're below 60 beats per minute here. And anything less than 60 beats per minute with upright QRS complexes, I'm sorry, upright P waves that are followed by QRS complexes, we're going to call that sinus bradycardia. So the only difference between sinus bradycardia and normal sinus rhythm is the rate at which the rhythm occurs on the EKG. All right, let's take a look at the next sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia. So remember we said the only difference between sinus tachycardia and normal sinus rhythm is the rate. And again, let's, uh, let's confirm that here on this tracing. So let's take a look. Are there P waves? Only one of them upright and rounded before each QRS complex. And in fact, that is the case. So here's a P wave. Here's another P wave. They're followed by a QRS complex and another P followed by a QRS. And that holds true for the rest of the EKG. There is one P wave and only one P wave for every QRS complex. All right, so next we're going to look at the PR interval duration. So we'll measure that. We'll say it's one, two. It's about three small boxes, so about 120 milliseconds. And that makes sense. The faster the underlying rhythm, the shorter the PR interval is going to become. And that makes sense because the faster the rhythm gets, the faster each and every component of that rhythm must also become. So in this case, this will be on the short end of normal at 120 milliseconds. Next, we're going to evaluate the QRS duration. And we'll do the same thing here. Remember to include the little Q wave. So we have about a half a box and then a full box. So we're at about 60 milliseconds here. Remember that as the rhythm gets faster, each and every single component is also going to become a little bit more narrow because it also is occurring faster. So the QRS duration here at about 60 milliseconds is also normal. All right, next we're going to look at the rhythm of this uh, EKG interpretation. And same, same method as we did before. You're going to take little hash marks on a note card and mark out two QRS complexes and then just march out those hash marks to make sure that they actually fall on those QRS complexes. And if you do that, you'll notice that these QRS complexes are separated by exactly the same distance. And as a result, we're going to say that this rhythm is very regular. All right, last but not least, we're going to look at the rate. Remember that using the sequence method as the rate exceeds 150 is, becomes a very unreliable method, although this still is below 150, so we can use that. But using the 1500 method is a better way of determining heart rate when we're in excess of 150. And we'll review that method in a different video. So we're going to take a look here and we're going to use the sequence method and we're going to say, all right, we're going to start with this QRS complex. Let's move out one small box. That would put us at a rate of 300 if another QRS fell here, but it doesn't. So we'll go out another small, uh, another big box. We'll go out to this point here. That would be the 150 mark. So we're just below 150. We're probably at a rate of right around 140 beats per minute. So upright QRS complexes, upright P waves, one P wave for every QRS complex, a regular rhythm, a normal PR interval duration. The only difference between sinus tachycardia and sinus rhythm is that in sinus tachycardia, the rate exceeds 100, as it does in this case. It falls between that sinus tachycardia rate range of 100 to 150. All right, last but not least, let's explore sinus dysrhythmia. Remember, sinus dysrhythmia is often seen in children. It's often a vagal stimulation response. That's what causes a change in the heart rate and a change, therefore, in the rhythm regularity. So the only difference between sinus dysrhythmia and normal sinus rhythm is that in sinus dysrhythmia, the QRS durations, the R to R intervals, will vary. Everything else will stay the same in terms of the P waves being upright and 
being followed by a QRS complex. The PR interval durations will be of normal duration. The QRS complex or the QRS waveform durations will be normal. And generally, sinus dysrhythmia falls within a rate range of somewhere between 60 and 100 because, in fact, it's coming from the sinus node and it's not a slow or fast sinus problem. It's, in fact, just a regularity change. So let's take a look at this rhythm. In fact, right before this QRS complex, we'll notice that there's a P wave. Let's go out another one. Here's another P wave followed by a QRS. Here's another P followed by a QRS. Here's another P wave followed by a QRS. And last but not least, this P wave followed by a QRS. So in fact, we have one P wave followed by one QRS complex. All right, next let's look at the PR interval duration. Let's just use this one to do that calculation. So we'll measure one, two, just about three little boxes, maybe three and a half little boxes. So we're right around 120 milliseconds or 140 milliseconds with the PR interval duration, which is absolutely within the normal range. Let's look at the QRS duration. Let's take this one. It's one, two small boxes. So here we're at 80 milliseconds for the QRS duration. That too is a normal time interval for depolarization of the ventricles. Next, we'll look at the rate. So this is going to be somewhat hard to do from this tracing. What you'll do in this tracing is you'd use a six second method. Right? And from the six second method, you would count the total number of QRS complexes. One, two, three, four, five, six of them in this six second method and we would multiply that result by 10. So that would put us right at 60 beats per minute. So the six second method describes the number of QRS complexes that occurs in every six seconds worth of EKG strip and then you multiply that number of QRS complexes by 10 to acquire the total number of beats in every minute. So in this case we're at 60 beats per minute. Last but not least we will look at the rhythm regularity. If you were to determine the distance between any two R waves here, you'll see that all of these R waves vary a little bit. And so when we have variable R to R intervals, we're gonna say that that rhythm is irregular. If there's any pattern to that irregularity, and we'll explore this further in a different video, if there's any pattern to the irregularity, we will call that a regularly irregular rhythm, meaning that there's pattern to the irregularity. In this case, there's absolutely no pattern. There is irregularly irregular interval duration between every single QRS complex here. And as a result, we'll define that as irregularly irregular. So the only difference between sinus dysrhythmia and normal sinus rhythm is the fact that these QRS complexes are separated by variable distances. In other words, they're irregularly irregular. Everything else stays the same with respect to the P wave, P wave shape, the number of the P waves, the PR interval durations, the QRS durations, and the underlying rate, which typically falls between 60 and 100 beats per minute. All right, stay tuned for more videos. We'll explore the atrial rhythms in a separate set of videos.